Hey guys, welcome to Telling the Told and Untold. My name is Tiro. Today's case is a two-parter. Part two will be uploaded on Sunday, so you won't have to wait that long. And yeah, there aren't any content warnings for this case, so let's just go straight into it. Tandiwe Betty Kitani grew up in New Bright in Queenstown and Betty was the English name that she was given when she started working but for the rest of this case I will be referring to her by her first name Tandiwe. Tandiwe was one of 10 children. Her mother got married to her first husband and had five children including Tandiwe and then the two of them got a divorce and then she remarried and had five more children. Tandiwe and her brother were raised by Tandiwe's mother's aunt, so her grandfather's sister. And once the two of them grew up, they started working and Tandiwe's first job was as a domestic worker, but then she decided to move to Johannesburg to the northern suburbs and she became a domestic worker for a doctor. But not too long after that, she found a job as a cook at a local restaurant called Cranks that was in Hillbrow. Cranks opened in the 80s and when it opened, it was the cultural hub of Hillbrow at the time and it said that the decorations were a bit different there were naked bobbies on the ceiling, they were like suspended and most of them were in Kama Sutra positions. Crank sold Indonesian food, Thai food as well as like Eastern cultural food and that's because the owner, his name was Eric Nietzsche Lemkas, was obsessed with like that side of the world. His first wife was a Thai woman which is also probably why he was interested in that type of cuisine but after a while Tandiwe had been working at Cranks for some time and she was promoted to head chef. Eric was described as someone who was explosive and he was allegedly very controlling of his staff and extremely secretive. He seemed to trust no one and he would hire and fire staff regularly. Many of Cranks' staff were illegal immigrants and this was prior to 1994 so he was able to get away with just firing them on the spot and you know just not treating them well. He also didn't care to learn their names and he would call them by the color of their aprons or just like by their physical appearance or something that would stand out to him. Like you know sometimes people will call you as a joke like oh my glass and like you know like you glasses. He would do that but you know it wasn't like in a funny way like as a joke like it was very disrespectful and he didn't really care about his employees. Despite Eric's temper, somehow Tandiwe managed to stick beside him and keep working at Cranks for almost 14 years. And because she had worked at Cranks for such a long period of time, Eric started to trust her more than he trusted some of his other workers and also the people that worked at Cranks looked up to Tandy where she was more like a mother figure to them and just someone that you know if they had any problems at Cranks they could always go and speak to her. So you could kind of say like she had maybe like an influence over the people that worked at Cranks. During her time there she did become a mother. She had three children. She had two girls and one boy. The two older children moved back to the Eastern Cape to live with her mother. Similar to how she grew up with her grandfather's sister. So the last born stayed with her and one of her sisters also lived with her. At the time when all of this was happening, her daughter was seven months. Despite the distance, Tandy was still made an effort to keep in contact with her siblings who were spread all over the country working and also keep in touch with her mother and her children as well. She was the breadwinner for her family, remember there were like 10 siblings and she would pay the school fees for some of her siblings to go to school and she was just really an important figure in her family. Tandiwe managed to keep her head up and maintained her delicacy balanced relationship with Eric until 1999 when everything changed. In April 1999, Cranks got a new boss and her name was Monique and she just so happened to be Eric's daughter. So Monique had moved back to South Africa. She had been living abroad with her sister and her mother so she decided to move back to South Africa to help her father run Cranks. At this point in time, Cranks had moved locations through times but had settled in in Rosebank and this was because Hilbra wasn't safe anymore and Eric just didn't think that it would suit the type of customers that he would get so he thought that Rosebank was the best place for them to go to but as soon as Monique 
came back to South Africa and started running cranks, things started changing and things started going downhill almost immediately. She started firing lots of staff and she also demoted Tandiwe, so Tandiwe was no longer head chef. I'm not too sure what she became, I think like maybe like a waitress or something like lower than head chef and this was because she didn't like that Tandiwe had like a relatively like good relationship with her father and also the fact that she had like an influence over the workers. She didn't like that and that's why she demoted Tandiwe. Legal processes were not adhered to, so a lot of the staff who were fired went to CCMA to lodge a complaint and Monique or Eric, like both of them didn't respond to the CCMA contacting them even though the CCMA had ruled in favour of the staff and they had to like settle with the workers, so they really just didn't care. On the 20th of May 1999, Tandiwe had a conversation with one of the workers at Cranks and she basically told this worker that she had lodged a complaint with the CCMA because Monique had unfairly demoted her and she didn't think it was right so she was just waiting for the CCMA to get back to her and she was hoping that they would rule in her favour. This was the last time anyone saw Tandiwe alive. It also turned out that the reason why Monique started firing a lot of the workers as cranks was because Eric had discovered that company checks had been stolen out of his checkbook and crashed fraudulently. Monique then conducted an audit of sorts and claimed to have found other forms of thefts including cash and stock and this is when Monique decided to call a private investigator so that they could look into all these fraudulent checks and stock missing as well as cash. And the PI company that she hired was being run by a man whose name was Carrington Lofton. Carrington presented himself as someone who was very educated, successful and in control of every aspect of his life when in reality it was really not that great. He and his wife had started CNC &C Commercial Services as an umbrella company. So basically Carrington wasn't really dedicated to any of the businesses that he would open, he would just go after the money so he, it wasn't really like a passion of his or anything like that. So if let's say one day a magazine company or magazines were doing really well and they would earn a lot of money, he would move there and then if something else was doing really well like construction or something he would move there so he was really just like all over the place so th that's why they decided to start this PI company and he didn't have any skills or any prior knowledge to how like on how to run a PI company or anything like that it was just like you know what let's start this and also because he had like a lot of connections with people it was very easy for him to start this company and for him to get a lot of like business and clients because people trusted him you know just that's just how Carrington was. So Monique hired this company to look into what was happening at Cranks. And already you can tell that it's not going to be that good because they literally have no skills and no prior knowledge on how to run investigations or anything like that. Carrington also then decided to open up another franchise in Cape Town and one of the first cases they ever got was for the Cape Town International Airport because someone had been stealing luggage and that just kind of goes to show you how well connected Carrington was because how was like your first client Cape Town International Airport you know like you don't even have references nothing like that but it was so easy for him to get business because you know he just knew people. Also, prior to Carrington and his wife offering private investigation services, they had supplied high-end equipment to the government on a tender basis. Because Carrington had two franchises, one in Joburg and one in Cape Town, he would travel between the two cities and he would later claim that in May 1999 he wasn't in Joburg, he was in Cape Town helping them uh, basically just navigate how to do the Cape Town International Airport investigation and just things like that and he would say that like Monique did hire him to look into what was happening at Cranks but he also had other people under him who had to run the investigation and he wasn't necessarily like a big part of it. He also said that he had also simply just placed an undercover agent at Cranks and because of what this agent had found Monique was able to just fire people based on you know evidence that they had gathered. 
but it would turn out that it was way more sinister than that. On the 21st of May 1999, Tandiwe Beiti Katania didn't turn up for work and most of the employees didn't think much of it because she had been unhappy at Cranks and they also thought that maybe her CCMA case had come through and she decided to leave with whatever settlement that she had got. When she didn't return home from work on the 20th of May, her sister, the one that she shared a flat with and the one that was helping her raise her seven month old, became very worried and and she just didn't know what to think so she called her boyfriend and oh didn't call her boyfriend she just thought that maybe Tandiwe had spent the night at her boyfriend's place and just maybe like forgot to tell her and just thought that she would see her the next day but two days later when Tandiwe's boyfriend got in contact with Tandiwe's sister he told her that the last time he saw or spoke to Tandiwe was on the 20th so that's when Tandiwe's sister started panicking and she thought that maybe something was wrong so she decided to call her siblings to let them know that Tandiwe was missing. It would emerge that the CCMA did rule in Tandiwe's favor and this immediately put her siblings on high alert. They didn't think that it was like impossible for her to just like leave Cranks without letting Eric know or like putting in a notice but they did think they didn't think that she would just like disappear without telling her siblings where she was going. After all she was like the breadwinner, she had the siblings that loved her, she was a mother, her two children were in the Eastern Cape and she she was living with her last born so they immediately thought that it was really strange and thought that something might have happened to her so some of her siblings then decided to come to Joburg so that they could look for her and try and figure out what happened to her or where she went. So one of the first things that her siblings decided to do was to search the flat and just look for any evidence that she might have or like any indication that she might have left willingly but all of her clothes were at home and the only clothes that were missing were the ones that she was seen wearing on the 20th of May. They also found her ID and she didn't have a passport so they didn't think that she would have left the country. It's not like impossible that she could have left the country without a passport but it was very unlikely. They then decided to search hospitals in case she had been admitted somewhere and morgues as well in case maybe she had passed away and because she didn't have any identification on her they weren't able to ID her but they literally couldn't find anything. This is when they decided to go to Cranks so that they could talk to Eric as well as some of Tandiwe's colleagues and just try and figure out uh, what she said on the last day that they saw her and if they had any information about where she might be or where she could have gone but as soon as they got to Cranks Eric didn't want no part of it he immediately chased them away and he told the workers at Cranks that they were not allowed to speak to Tandiwe's family and get in contact with them so they immediately thought that it was a bit suspicious that he would do that and they were just wondering why he would like chase them away or why he wouldn't just like even let them speak to the workers and just ask questions about Tandiwe and you know about the last time that they saw her and if they knew anything. After a week of searching some of Tandiwe's siblings had to leave Joburg and return back to the Eastern Cape because you know they just had to they couldn't like sustain themselves in Joburg. They had to go back home they had to continue working and making a living and they decided to take Tandiwe's seven month old daughter with them. Once they got home they really didn't want to tell their mother about Tandiwe's disappearance because they were hoping that maybe she would come back and you know like she would just pop up and tell them that it was all a big misunderstanding and just things like that. But Tandiwe's brother didn't like that. He really thought that Eric had something to do with Tandiwe's disappearance so he decided to tell his mother and his mother said that they should wait for a bit before they report her missing because at the time like South Africa had only been like democratic South Africa for about it was 99 so like five years so she didn't trust the police like she just she didn't trust them yet and she didn't want to go report her daughter missing because you know she was just very 
hesitant but Tandy Wood's brother was not having that he was like they can't wait any longer so he decided to go to the Hillbrow police station to open a missing persons report for Tandiwe Betty Kitani and he gave them all his information he gave them a second address that or he gave them an address that they could go to if they wanted to get in contact with him he gave them a alternative number to get in contact with him and he also told them that he thought that maybe Cranks and Eric might have had something to do with Tandiwe's disappearance it would later turn out that the man that took Tandiwe's information and had to put it in the system it's like a missing person's database so that if someone's missing you can literally just like maybe like type their name and see if a missing persons report has been opened for them the person that was in charge of putting this information in this database actually put in like he basically just butchered Tandiwe's name and Tandiwe's surname he didn't type in like Tandiwe correctly and he didn't type in Katani correctly the only thing that he spelled correctly was her second name Betty Tandiwe's missing persons report was filed on the 31st of May 1999 and the only file or the only notes that were found in the file was that the investigating officer couldn't get a hold of Tandiwe's brother but they didn't understand why because as I mentioned he had given them an alternative number, he had given them his address. It will also later turn out that they didn't investigate Tandiwe's disappearance at all. They didn't go visit her flat, they didn't speak to her friends, they didn't speak to her colleagues they didn't speak to her boyfriend they didn't go to cranks and like ask them any questions they didn't speak to eric they didn't speak to any of her co-workers despite the fact that her brother literally told them that that's where she was last seen and also the fact that he thinks that they might have had something to do with her disappearance they literally did nothing they just closed the file and put it in a random drawer and it wouldn't be seen for years as time went on police officers didn't contact Tandiwe's family and they just had to continue going through life without knowing what happened to Tandiwe and they just hoped that maybe the police would contact them about her disappearance and just try and find out any information but they wouldn't contact them for years and they just had to try and live without her and as I mentioned earlier Tandiwe was also the breadwinner so some of her siblings could and continue going to school because they didn't have money for transport and things just became really challenging for her family. It would later emerge that around the same time that Tandiwe disappeared, there was a policeman investigating events that would come really close to Cranks and Tandiwe, but the connection wouldn't be made for years. Shortly before Tandiwe disappeared, during the investigations into the thefts at Cranks, past employees from Cranks were getting visits from a group of people. These visits would happen in the middle of the night and one of the men who received one of these visits was Temba Shabalala. So Temba was at home sleeping when suddenly there was a knock at the door and he went to go open the door and a group of men just burst inside his house. I think there were about three men and there was one woman. They immediately started asking him where his wife was because his wife had also been working at Cranks alongside him before they decided to leave and they also asked him about the location of two other people who had worked at Cranks. Temba told them that his wife was currently in KwaZulu Natal and she wasn't there and he also told them that he didn't know where the two other people that they were looking for lived. They then told him that they were with the police and they started asking him about the thefts into cracks and he told them that he didn't know anything and then they took him and placed him into a car and they drove off. They drove to the middle of nowhere and once he got out of the car they tied him up and they tortured him trying to find information and after that they left him on the side of the road just outside of Joburg and he had to find his way back home. When these people took Tim but he was so terrified and they told him that they were with the police but he didn't believe them at all because the way they were conducting themselves was just very suspicious and strange and he also noted the fact that all of their uniforms were different so how were they with the police if their uniforms were different he would later give police officers a registration number of another car that he saw it was a Mazda Stena and yeah 
When Tim eventually made his way back home, he discovered that his flat had been ransacked and this group of people had taken an envelope that had cash inside that he had been saving so that he could buy himself a car, which is just so sad. And because he was so scared of the group, he really didn't do anything about it. And after a couple of weeks, Timber was working at his new job in Maldus Drift and his new boss was completely different compared to Eric. He was nicer, he was just a kind man. So whilst Timber was there working, this group of people approached him and he immediately got so scared and he knew it was the same group from last time. So his boss asked him like, you know, like, do you know these people? Because they wanted to take Temba away. And Temba told his boss that he didn't think that they were with the police. And he told his boss about what had happened to him the last time and how they had basically kidnapped him and tortured him. And his boss said, okay. And his boss decided to call the local police station. And the local police station dispatched two police officers to Mulder's Drift to where Temba was working. And they told Temba and his boss that the group of men that wanted to take Timber with them did actually work with the police. Timber was very hesitant, he thought it was a bit strange, he still didn't believe that they worked with the police, but because the police had said that it's safe for him to go with them, he really didn't have much of a choice. And again, he was kidnapped by this group of men and they again tortured him looking for information. After Timba was kidnapped and assaulted a second time, he couldn't let it go, so he decided to go to the police to go report what had happened to him. He was scared not only for his safety, but the safety of his wife, who was still in KZN, as well as the two people that this group of people were looking for. The policeman who was investigating Timba's case decided to go look for the two people that this group had mentioned, just to try and figure out if maybe like something similar had happened to them or if they had any information and one of the people he went to um, their names was Ndaba Bebe and once he got there Ndaba wasn't there it was I think one of his neighbors or a sibling and they basically told this police officer that Timba had been kidnapped by this group of people and they basically like tortured him as well and he ended up in the hospital and he had had mild brain damage. The third Cranks worker, her name was Ruth Ngobo, and she was almost kidnapped. So what had happened is that this group of people had found her and they were basically like dragging her to the car when people in her community saw what was happening. So they basically went after this group and she managed to escape. And this is when she packed up everything and she was basically in hiding. And as soon as the police officer heard this and he heard all three stories from these three people, he immediately made a connection and that connection was Cranks. The officer then investigated the possibility of police involvement in Timber's kidnapping as well as the two other people and because Timber had memorized the number plate of one of the cars when he was kidnapped, the police officer decided to run it and he discovered that the car belonged to one of the reservists and when he looked into who had used the car on the days that Timber was kidnapped, he discovered that the car had been used by a policeman and his name was Carl Ranger alongside a reservist whose name was Andre Kozia. So he managed to get in contact with these two men and he basically just asked them why they had picked up Timber and they said that they had picked up Timber because they had received an anonymous tip that Timber was an illegal immigrant so them picking Timber up was a legitimate reason. He then also asked them about them assaulting and torturing Timber but they denied those accusations and he also asked them why they had been operating outside of their jurisdiction but they said that the anonymous tip had been called into their police station so they didn't see anything wrong with it and that's why they were operating outside of their jurisdiction. Because the police officer had linked all three cases to the in internal investigation that had been happening at Cranks, he thought that the best next step would be for him to go to Cranks and basically just 
try and figure out what was happening so he got to cranks in rosebank and when he got there eric was not there but his daughter monique was the officer said that as soon as he saw monique he had a bad feeling about her and she basically told the officer that she didn't know anything about the assaults the kidnappings that had been happening but she did tell him about the stolen checks and that she had a few suspects the investigating officer of these cases then wanted to hold an identity parade with Carl Ranger as well as Andre Godzilla just to see if the three people so Temba, Ndaba as well as Ruth could identify them in an identity parade or like a line up but the three of them didn't show up when it was time because they were so terrified and they just wanted to put it behind them and that was the end of this police officer's investigation into the kidnappings and assaults that were linked to cranks so a couple of years have went by and now we're in 2004 and Tandiwe Betty Katani was still missing. Her children didn't know about her disappearance or anything like that. They only overheard about a missing persons report that had been opened for their mother and that's how they found out that their mother was missing. The youngest daughter, the one that was seven months old when Tandiwe disappeared, she was told that one of Tandiwe's sisters was actually her mother and she discovered that her aunt wasn't her mother when she was basically just looking through some documents and she found a paper from when she was in hostel when she was born and it on it it was written that her mother was Tandiwe Betty Katani and she didn't even know who that person was and when she questioned her family about this and who this person was they basically just told her that it was someone who had helped out when she was newborn like when she was newborn and it was just like a family friend or something like that they didn't tell her that it was actually her mother and the reason why they didn't tell any of Tandiwe's children about like their mother being missing was because they didn't know how to bring it up and deep down they always believed that one day she would walk through those doors alive and they were just waiting for that day after the investigation into cranks wrapped up Carrington, the one who owned the PI business that was looking into the thefts at cranks he still maintained a relationship with monique Carrington was still married to his wife Candace at the time that he was having an affair with Monique and once his wife found out about this affair, she tried to take her own life. Carrington eased out of the private investigation business and tried several other businesses during this time. He lived overseas for periods and then he would return to South Africa. Monique left South Africa in 2002 to live in Thailand and then she settled in Australia. But before Carrington broke up contact with Monique and ceased his work at Cranks, Eric, the owner of Cranks, was the victim of several robberies. One of the robberies happened in his house and he had a strong suspicion that it was an inside job. He claimed that in total he had lost about 450,000 rand in thefts and robberies that had happened to him. He really believed that Carrington had something to do with it but he couldn't rub off like the feeling that his own daughter Monique had something to do with all of the thefts and robberies that had been happening. There was also a robbery at a jewelry store that had happened a couple of like meters or I don't know like a few minutes away from Eric's home and he didn't think it had anything to do with what had been happening with him and the robberies and thefts that he had been dealing with but he soon discovered something that made him think otherwise. So he discovered that Carrington had bought his second wife uh, an engagement ring at the same jewelry store that had been robbed and he just couldn't shake off the feeling that, you know, Carrington had something to do with it. When Monique fled the country in 2002, her father Eric decided to follow her all the way to Thailand. The reason why he was following her is, as I mentioned, he had a strong suspicion that Monique might have been 
like had something to do with all the robberies that had been happening to him so when he kind of confronted her that's that's why she ran away to thailand so he basically followed her there and found her hotel room and as he was going through her hotel room he found a copy of a fax and basically it was a story about a house robbery that involved six men and it was very similar to what had happened to him and the robbery at his house if not exactly the same and that's why he thought that Monique and Carrington were basically like working together and had something to do with all these robberies and thefts. Carrington met his second wife, her name was Jane, whilst he was still married to his first wife, Candace. Jane soon fell pregnant and once Carrington and Candace's divorce was finalized, Carrington and Jane got married and whilst they were married, Carrington had given Jane an envelope and he basically just told Jane to look after this envelope. He told her that it was his insurance policy and Jane really didn't think much of it and she just put it in her father's safe and she just really forgot about it. Over the years, Carrington would just go on to do a lot of things. As I mentioned earlier, he really just like followed the money. So when he'd open businesses, he would go for businesses where he knew he would earn like a profit. So it was like the same with his life, like he couldn't stay in one place. Over the years, he had moved houses 12 times, he had opened several businesses and Jane was not his last wife. Now we enter Conway Brown into the case. There are so many names and so many people that play a part in this case. Um, there are some names that I don't mention just because I think it would be easier for you guys to follow. So I try to only mention the names that play like an important role. Not that other people don't play an important role, but like the names that are like more significant than others. Do I make sense? I think I'm making sense. But anyways, let's talk about Conway. So Conway met Carrington in 1998 and Conway was a very simple man. He didn't really have like a stable job. He would just work on jobs here and there. He was also an artist. He would like draw and do like paintings, but that was just like a hobby that he would do on the side. At the time that he met Carrington. He was married to his wife Blanche. They've been married for about five years at this point and Conway was very struck by Carrington and this was because Carrington had a lot of money more than Conway ever had. Conway would just live basically like he and his wife would just live paycheck to paycheck and Carrington was not like that in any way. Carrington, okay what Conway would spend on groceries for the month would be what Carrington would spend at lunch on like a random Tuesday. That was like the difference between the two. And Conway really wanted to be like Carrington, like you know, like have this amount of money, be able to spend like that. So when Carrington offered Conway a job in his PI business, Conway basically just jumped at this opportunity and he was really excited to be a part of it. He says at first he would just do like really small jobs for the PI business. He would just drive some of the agents here and there. He didn't play a really significant role. So just before Conway met Carrington, he and his wife started renting a property in Kenilworth and this property was connected to the main house where they're like laborers there the people they were renting from lived so they were like these two houses were connected and they had a really good relationship with the marshals the marshals was who they were renting the property from and they had like a really good friendship even though they were renting they were like you know like friends and the marshals started noticing that conway started acting very different in 2004. He started drinking more than he would. He would get drunk a lot. And he also started losing weight. He seemed very stressed. And it was just something that they really took note of. And then in December, the marshals were going to spend the holidays in Durban. So they asked 
Conway and his wife to look after their house until they came back so they went all the way to Durban and then in January the following year they came back home and then they noticed that Conway and his wife had moved out without letting them know they didn't ask for their deposit back and they had paid their rent two months in advance and didn't ask for that money back they didn't ask them why they had moved out or try and get into contact with them because they thought that you know what if they just wanted to leave without letting us know they probably have a reason and they just didn't want to pry into things that really didn't have anything to do with them a couple of years go by and now we're in 2010 and everyone knows that in 2010 South Africa was hosting the World Cup, the Soccer World Cup and Carrington saw this as a business opportunity so he was basically um, offering security services to the tourists and Cranks was also receiving some business but in 2010 Cranks wasn't doing that well for themselves and even the tourists that came for the Soccer World Cup couldn't keep the doors at Cranks open for a long period of time. Around the same time, Carrington also got married to his third wife and they would go on to have two children. In 2010, Monique, Eric's daughter, Eric was the one who owned Cranks, she also started making a name for herself in Australia. So at the time she was working as an air hostess for a well-known um, air company, fly company flight company yeah called Jetstar and there was one day where she said that she found a fake explosive in the toilet on a plane and then the she says like Jetstar wasn't really treating her well and they really didn't give her like the flowers that she wanted for her like finding this explosive or fake explosive device in the toilet so she decided to take them to court and she said that the airline was not following labor protocols and testified in an inquest as a result. The airline then hit back and said that Monique was dismissed because the trauma she suffered from the incident combined with a personality disorder she suffered from made it impossible for her to carry out her duties. Then again, a couple of years would go by and now we're in 2012. And on the 31st of March 2012, the Marshalls had managed to get rid of tenants from the property that Conway and his wife used to live in and they got rid of these tenants because they owed them money and they just really didn't want bad tenants so that's basically why they kicked them out so once they finally managed to kick these bad tenants out they decided that they just wanted to like revamp the house that they were living in for the new tenants that were going to come in they decided that they wanted to tear up the carpets because the carpets had been there for so long they had been there for over 20 years the carpets were like cheap quality they also smelled like dog pee and you know they just wanted a change so they decided to rip up the carpets so as they were ripping up the carpets one of the marshal's son was in the main bedroom and as he ripped up the carpets he found a huge bunch of papers all stacked together so the marshal thought it was a bit strange you know so they sat down they're like oh let's go through these papers and on it it was written do not throw away so they opened it and the first one that they opened had some names written on it some of the names had numbers next to it others had id numbers and one simply said alive next to it the names that were included on this paper included eric ruth and gobo dirk dave and carl roger a second piece of paper was hand was a handwritten letter and it was written on a scrap piece of paper in a pencil the letter was addressed to Blanche and remember Blanche is Conway's um, wife and basically the letter said uh, dear Blanche this is what happened and it basically went on to ex uh, talk about a robbery that had taken place and when the marshals were reading it they really didn't know if 
they were talking about a robbery that was going to happen or a robbery that had happened because the person who had written the letter had been interchanging between past and present tense so it was a bit confusing then the next paper that they decided to read had been all typed up and it seemed as though it was like an affidavit and the date that was written on it was the 30th of september 1999 and the first words that were written were a sandal if you're reading this i am dead and that's it for part one. Part two will be uploaded in a couple of days. I promise you won't have to wait that long. I know it's a bit confusing and there were like so many names and so many things to follow, but I hope I explained it well. And I'll see you guys in part two. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and leave a comment about like your thoughts and opinions. It really helps me out a lot more than you know. And yeah, I'll see you guys soon. Bye.